Uh oh, guess what day it is? What is up, everybody? Thanks for tuning in to Talking Whatever Wednesday. I'm Chuck Finley, and I'm glad you're listening today. Before I get started, let's drop the pluggables. Uh, you can follow the show on Twitter at TWWPod1. Check us out on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Talking Whatever Wednesday. Feel free to give it five stars on whatever platform you use to listen to podcasts. Right now, you can find us on Google Podcast, Pocket Cast. Radio Public, Spotify, Stitcher, and iTunes. And if you have any questions or comments or suggestions, email me at talkingwhateverwednesday at gmail.com. Now, I was going to record an episode about the time that Adam Sandler saved my dog. Unfortunately, that's not a very good story. It's kind of lame when I got back to listening to it. So that's going to go in the uh, for- Forgotten Freshness kind of file. Maybe I'll release that one day. Maybe I'll re- I'll tweak it. I don't know. But right now, let's talk about some more people who escaped from prison. Uh, let's see. German Naval Air Service Lieutenant Gunther Plöschow escaped from the Donington Hall prisoner of war camp in t- 1915. On May 1st, 1915, Plöschow was sent to a prisoner of war camp in Donington Hall in Leicestershire. On July 4th of that year, he escaped during a storm and headed for London. Scotland Yard issued an alert asking the public to be on the lookout for for a man with a dragon tattoo on his arm. Disguised as a worker, he felt safe enough to take souvenir photographs of himself at London docks. That's awesome. He occupied his time by reading books about Patagonia and also visited the British Museum. For For security reasons, no notices were published announcing the departure of ships, but by observing the river... He saw the fairy Princess Juliana sailing for the neutral Netherlands and sneaked on board. He arrived safely and finally reached Germany, where he, where he was at first arrested as a spy, since no one believed he could have <laughs> accomplished such a feat. He is the only German combatant during either World War to escape from a POW camp in the British Isles. Well, good for him. Let's see. This next one's a doozy. Frederick Moores, born Karl Menarek on October 2nd, 1889, was an Austrian-born American serial killer. Moores immigrated to New York City from his native Austria-Hungary in June 1914. The German-speaking Moores gained employment as a porter for the German Odd Fellows home in Unionport, New York, which is now the Bronx, through the Immigrant Free Employment Bureau. The home housed 250 orphans and 100 elderly men and women. Though he terrified the older residents, both the younger residents and visitors seemed to like him and enjoy his company. He exhibited signs of megalomania soon after beginning to work at the nursing home. He would wear a white lab coat with a stethoscope around his neck and insisted that the elderly residents address him as Herr Doctor. In the fourth four-month period between September 1914 to January 1915, 17 residents died at the home. And apparently that's an unusually high number. Uh, fearing foul play, the administration called the police in to investigate. Early in, the inv- early in the investigation, police learned of the fear the elderly patients had of Mr. of Moore's. On these grounds, he soon became the primary suspect of the investigation. When questioned, though, he readily and calmly admitted to killing eight of the 17 patients who had recently died. He claimed these were mercy killings and that they, they had been nuisances. He later claimed he was putting them out of their misery. In detail, he described his method. Quote, 
First, I would pour a drop or two of chloroform on a piece of absorbent cotton and hold it to the nostrils of the person. Soon my man would swoon. Then I would close the orifices of the body with cotton, stuffing it in the ears, nostrils, and so on. Next, I would pour a little chloroform down the throat and prevent the fumes escaping that way. End quote. Uh, Moore's also claimed the home superintendent, superintendent had encouraged him to kill more ill people and more elderly patients. Isn't that nice? I, I, don't, I don't believe that part, though. Uh, the district attorney declined to prosecute Moore's, finding him to be criminally insane and committed him to the H Hudson River State Hospital, pending deportation to Austria. Moore's escaped from the institution in May 1916. In May, in uh, 20, sorry, 2017. In 1917, he resurfaced in Torrington, Connecticut, living under the alias of Frederick Maurice Bino, working in the first aid department of Turner and Seymour Company. He was the same birthday as Moore's in a World War I draft registration. He also sent three letters saying he was the same person that had killed eight people in New York. He left notes of suicidal intent and disappeared in April 1918. A skeletonized corpse was discovered in May 1923 that was identified as his by officials who examined the remains at the time. The remains had been there for at least four years and was identified based on the type of shoes that both Moores and Bino were known to have worn. Two bottles were found nearby that were presumed to be poison. So he got off light, let's say that. Uh, Victor Folk Nelson was born in Malmo, Sweden on June 5, 1898. His parents, Anna and Carl Nelson, immigrated to the U.S. with him and his three siblings when he was three years old. The family struggled economically, and Victor's mother died when he was seven years old. He spent the next six years in Swedish Lutheran Orphanage of Massachusetts. Orphanage, rec orphanage records documented that Victor was bright, but had difficulties constructively managing his boredom. I mean, don't we all? He, fre he frequently ran away and was eventually placed in the Lyman School for Boys. He served in the British Royal Flying Corps from 1916 to 1918, then enlisted in the United States Naval Reserve in 1918. Uh, his first charge of larceny occurred when he was 18 years old, but was discharged by a grand jury in New York City. He was incarcerated twice in the Portsmouth Naval Prison punishment for his absence without leave where he met and worked as an office clerk for the prison for the then prison commander Thomas Mott Osborne. Remember that name for later. Nelson received a dishonorable, dishonorable discharge from the U.S. Naval Reserve in 1920. Uh, between 1920 and 1932, he cycled in and out of various New York and Massachusetts prisons, spending a total of 12 and a half years incarcerated, primarily for robbery and larceny crimes. Uh, now, in May of 1921, at age 22, Nelson made a sensational and highly publicized run and escape from Charleston State Prison. He spent, he spent some days planning his, planning his escape and modifying a pair of prison-issued shoes, replacing the heavy soles with homemade felt soles to enable both speed and silent running. He made his break from a line of 13 prisoners after attending evening school in the prison chapel. During an attempted Despite an attempted intervening tackle from a prisoner trustee, that's a uh, prisoner who has like special benefits, and benefits from a guard's gun, Nelson ran some distance, leapt, caught the lower end of the, of the window bars, scaled the 40-foot high wall of the prison's Cherry Hill section. Then at the top of the wall, he performed, quote, what was believed an impossible stunt, throwing his body a 10-foot space to the wall, end quote, where he managed to catch hold of the false coping of a small building in the corner where the south wing joined the main wall. I mean, if you're not picturing Kurt Russell or Sylvester Stallone during their prison escape and Tango and Cash, I don't know what to tell you, but moving on. Uh, the top of the false coping was too wide for him to grip with his fingers, but he managed to catch you know, with a crook of his arms, regain his balance, and then topple over the outer wall to drop 30 feet down to the Boston and Maine railroad tracks where two brickmen saw him but made no effort to stop him. Wait, that, that just said 30 feet. I think we're missing some details, but I, mean, I could be wrong. I don't think that could have been a straight drop, but I digress. Now, Nelson's friends gave him money for clothing, and on the day of escape, 
Nelson even joined in a scrub baseball game at Boston Common while authorities were searching for him. He stayed in Boston for 10 days, then traveled to Massachusetts, West Virginia, New York, and Pennsylvania before heading to Ohio. After just a short time in East Liverpool, Ohio, he was nearly, nearly apprehended by a team of Pennsylvania and Ohio detectives, but he managed to escape across the state line to West Virginia, where none of the, de the detectives had jurisdiction to make arrests, which I don't think that would stop them today, but who am I? In August 1921, Nelson learned that Thomas Mott Osborne was touring the region to promote the film The Right Way and would be speaking at a Cincinnati movie theater. Whoop, whoop. During his lecture, Osborne spoke about how the new Secretary of the Navy, appointed by President Warren G. Harding, had terminated the Mutual Welfare League program for prisoners that Osborne had started at Portsmouth Naval Prison, which was a program that, he, that had impressed Nelson deeply. Osborne bemoaned that those prisoners who had given innovative prison reform programs a bad name by failing to live constructively after release from prison. Nelson approached Osborne after the lecture, telling him he felt regret for having been you know, the type of prisoner who undermined public faith in Osborne's prison reform work. Nelson agreed to leave Cincinnati and return to Osborne's home in Auburn, New York. Remaining, remaining there for a week and then was accompanied by Osborne when he decided to turn himself in to Charleston Prison Warden Elmer E. Shattuck. At Nelson's subsequent resentencing trial, Osborne testified on, on his behalf and helped to persuade, persuade the judge not to add too much time to Nelson's sentence as extra punishment for having escaped, despite the protest of Warren Shattuck and the district attorney. I mean, yeah, the guy escaped. You know, now you get what an extra ten years. I mean, that's cool. The guy came to his aid, but you know that, yeah, whatever. Um, in 1922, an IRA bomb blew a hole in the wall of the jail in Dundalk County, Louth, Ireland. 106 IRA prisoners escaped. A few weeks later, these same prisoners returned fully armed and took over the whole prison, freeing the remaining prisoners. Uh, Leonard T. Fristo was imprisoned for double murder in 1920 of a police constable and a deputy sheriff in Nevada. He escaped from Nevada State Prison in 1923. He lived for nearly 46 years under the alias of Claude R. Willis before being turned in by his own son. After several years in prison, he died of natural causes. Wow. Don't trust anybody. On January 25th, 1934, John Dillinger and his gang were captured in Tucson, Arizona. He was extradited from, to Indiana and escorted back by Matt Leach, the chief of the Indiana State Police. Dillinger was taken to the Lake County Jail in Crown Point, Indiana and imprisoned to face charges for the murder of policeman William O'Malley, who was killed during a Dillinger bank, gang bank robbery in East Chicago, Indiana on January 15th, 1934. On March 3rd of 1934, Dillinger escaped from the, as it was dubbed by local authorities at the time, escape proof Crown Point, Indiana County Jail, which was guarded by many police officers and National Guardsmen. Dillinger was able to escape during morning exercises with 15 other inmates. He produced a pistol, catching deputies and guards by surprise, and was able to leave the premises without even firing a shot. Now, almost immediately afterwards, conjecture began whether the gun Dillinger displayed was real or not. According to Deputy Ernest Blunk, Dillinger had escaped using a real pistol. FBI files, on the other, other hand, indicate Dillinger had used a carved fake pistol. Uh, Sam Cahoon, a trustee who Dillinger took hostage in the jail, also believed Dillinger had carved the gun using a razor and some shelving from his cell. In another version, though, according to an unpublished interview with Dillinger's attorney, Louis Piquette. Investigator Art O'Leary claimed to have sneaked the gun in himself. Wouldn't that make him complicit? Why Why say that? That's stupid. Why, why would you do that? That doesn't make any sense. All right, but either way, real gun, fake gun, Dillinger escaped. I like the fake gun story myself. It's just a lot funnier. Um, last one. Uh, Yoshi Shiratori was a Japanese national born in uh, Aoromi Prefecture. I'm sure I'm butchering that, and I, and I apologize. 
Uh, he's famous for having escaped from several prisons, making him an anti-hero in Japanese culture. There are numerous tales describing his escapes, and some details may be folkloric rather than factual. Uh, you know, a, a good apocryphal story never hurts anybody. Like uh, President Washington chopping down the cherry tree when he was a kid. You know, whatever. That just makes him better. But these stories are great. Uh, Shiratori initially worked in a tofu shop and later as a fisherman to catch crabs in Russia. After switching jobs several times and finding little success, he turned to gambling for a living. Um, in 1936, he was falsely accused of robbery and murder and was imprisoned at Aomori Prison. However, after studying the guard's routine for months, he escaped by picking his cell lock with the metal wire that was wrapped around the bucket provided for bathing and escaped through a cold, cracked skylight. Before escaping, he placed floorboards onto his futon to fool the passing guards into thinking he was still asleep. So, like a teenager sneaking out in the middle of the night, tricking his mom into thinking he's sleeping by fluffing up some pillows and blankets into a human-like shape, this guy escaped prison the first time. The first time. Uh, police recaptured Shiratori after three days while stealing supplies from a hospital. Since the life in prison for escaping and theft, he was transferred to Akita Prison in 1942. Uh, there, he was placed in a cell specifically de designed for escape artists, featuring high ceilings, one small skylight, and smooth copper walls. Nevertheless, he was able to scale the walls and noticed that the wood holding the window bars was beginning to rot. Every night, he would climb up to loosen the vent until he finally managed to pry away the wood and open the skylight. Knowing prison staff would be, able to use, would be able to hear his footsteps on the roof, Shiratori waited until a stormy night to climb the walls and escape. Three months later, he showed up at guard Kobayashi's house to ask for help in a case against injustice in the Japanese prison system. As he was one of the only people who had shown kindness and respect to Shiratori during his stay in the Akita prison. However, while Shiratori was in the bathroom, the guard called the police and Shiratori was arrested and sent back to prison. Alright, uh, during the winter of 1943, Shiratori was transferred to Abashiri Prison in northern Hokkaido. I'm probably butchering that, it's H-O-K-K-A-I-D-O, -K the country's northernmost prison. He was thrown into an open cell exposed to the extreme cold, allowing the guards to beat him whenever he stood up. Nice. Dicks. Angrily, Shiratori vowed to escape, and to the guards' amazement, broke his handcuffs in front of them. He went fucking Hulk. It's awesome. Uh, later, he was placed in specially made handcuffs, taking nearly two hours to unlock by a specialist who came once per week so that he could bathe. When the, guard when the guards delivered his meals, however, he would always drip miso soup on the handcuffs and food slot. Both of those became corroded, allowing Shiratori to break them. That sounds like it took a long time, but worth it. On August 26, 1944, he dislocated both of his shoulders, a la Martin Riggs and Lethal Weapon 2, no less, enabling him to fit out of the narrow food slot in his cell door and escape the prison using a wartime blanket as cover. After living in an abandoned mine deep in the mountains for two years, he descended to a nearby village and learned of the surrender of Japan. However, he was captured yet again after failing, fatally stabbing a farmer who attacked him after he was caught stealing a tomato from the farm. He said it was an act of self-defense, but, but by now he had made headlines on several new newspapers in the area. Uh, for, his previous uh, for his previous escapes and the farmer's murder, Shiratori was sentenced to death by Sapporo District Court. At the Sapporo prison, he was placed in a specially designed cell with high ceilings and windows smaller than his head. However, because the prison guards at Sapporo had so much faith in it that they no longer bothered to handcuff Shiratori, and because they paid so much attention to his ceiling escapes, they neglected the floors. In 1947, he dug his way out by making a tunnel with miso bowl soups, placing the, bur placing the dirt <laughs> in a small pocket under the floorboards. After a year of freedom, it is said that Shiratori was offered a cigarette by a police officer in a park. Moved by the kindness, as you know, in 1948, cigarettes were a luxury item in Japan, Shiratori admitted that he was an escaped convict to the officer and offered to, offered to be turned in. 
He was arrested and tried once again, but the High Court of Sapporo, having reviewed his case, decided that the farmer's death was, was a result of acting in self-defense, and during his escapes, he had not once injured or killed a single guard. As a result, the court revoked his death sentence and said sentencing him to 20 years for his escapes. Shiratori's request to be imprisoned in Tokyo was also granted. He spent 14 years in Fuchu prison until 1961 when he was released for good behavior. Later, he returned to Aomori to reunite with his daughter. His wife had died while he was in prison. He lived for another decade working odd jobs to survive. Eventually succumbed to a heart attack in 1979 at the age of 71. A novel and TV drama, Hagoku, was based on his true story. And those are just some more of the amazing tales of people who escaped prison. Wow, like I said before, people go to prison, people don't want to be there, some are going to try to escape, and some of those stories are freaking amazing. Um, thank you guys for listening. Uh, if you have any questions or anything, feel free to email me at talkingwhateverwednesday at gmail.com. Uh, check out the Facebook page, facebook.com slash talkingwhateverwednesday. Follow me on Twitter at TWWpod1, and I am out.